series of lessons the letter to Ephesians. Letter to the Ephesians, chapter 1. Letter to the Ephesians, by the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestined us to adoption as sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us accepted and the beloved, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of His glory. Amen. The letter is sent by the Apostle Paul from Rome. He is imprisoned, probably, or in the house where they had uh, set him, uh, they had put him in, in uh, they imprisoned him so that he may present himself before Caesar, where God had uh, delivered him from great peril and danger of death in Jerusalem because the, Jew the Jews, the scribes, and the Pharisees, and the priests had decided to kill him. So he sends his letter to Ephesus, to the Ephesians, as in Ephesus God had led him in his first apostolic journey, and indeed it was also the most glorious one, I'd say, as he remained for a long while, two years approximately in Ephesus, and it says that the gospel was preached throughout the whole world, and God confirmed and worked in the sermon of the Apostle Paul with signs and wonders and great things, even that even with the apparel of Paul, God healed people. Ephesus was a church that, as we said from the beginning, started gloriously. Indeed, in other words, God was praised in this apostolic journey. Immediately after Ephesus, he went to Jerusalem, where he suffered much. And now he is in Rome, where he never forgets his brothers, and he sends them this beautiful letter, which describes the mysteries of God and may God help us in this walk of ours that we will have through the letter of the Ephesians so we can see the wisdom of the Word of God, the wisdom of Paul through Jesus Christ, the wisdom of the Almighty God. So Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. The apostle Paul is sure of this, that he is not going wherever he wants and he is not sent by men. But wherever he goes, the Lord Jesus Christ sends him, and for that reason he 
confirms his words. And for that reason, the signs of the apostles are revealed in his journey. But no one receives a ministry like the apostle Paul received the ministry of an apostle. Of course, he was a teacher of the Gentiles. He had another ministry as well as also an evangelist and a preacher, as he himself testified. It appears, he himself has not testified to this, that he was a pastor, and he couldn't be a pastor because he was unmarried, and he wasn't also a prophet. He didn't have the ministry of a prophet, even though, of course, God spoke to him, and the Apostle Paul always spoke by the Holy Spirit. So the ministries are given by Christ, as that of the apostle, of the prophet, of the pastor, of the evangelist, of the teacher. They are given by Jesus Christ, therefore, but always by the will of God. The thing which is very important for us to know, as God records this, is that nothing is done unless Christ does it. Only that in the New Testament, whatever God does, He does it, Nothing happens unless God does it. Nothing can occur unless God permits it or God does it. Only that in the New Testament, all things are done through Jesus Christ. So by the will of God, our Lord Jesus Christ visits Paul and he made him an apostle and teacher and evangelist. So we will see that the letter is directed, first of all, to the saints who are in Ephesus, and then to the believers in Christ Jesus. They are two different things, but which are very close. But somebody may be holy, and he may not be faithful to his Lord Jesus Christ. He may be faithful to his Lord Jesus Christ, but to not be holy. So let us see what holiness means, first of all. There can be no holy person unless first he becomes born again after receiving Jesus Christ, that he is the Son of the living God, and afterward he is not baptized in water so that the body of the sins of the flesh may be taken off of him and that he may be baptized in water unto the remission of sins. Holy means separated. In other words, God separates, I repeat, in the New Testament, through Jesus Christ, He separates some people, and He separates them unto Himself, as His own. And of course, He leads them in the exact thing that God has prepared for them. He separates people by giving them a mission, by determining a specific work for them. And so I can say it more correctly and according to the Word of God. He determines the path and the good works which He, before the foundation of the world, has prepared for every one of them. So, holy is the one who is separated. But that is not enough. He has to remain holy. In other words, God separates him, God sanctifies him as he repents and returns to God. Through Jesus Christ, he repents, he returns to God, he confesses his sins and the Father regenerates him onto a living hope. For an inheritance that is unfading and uncorruptible and eternal, which God has kept in heaven, and He will give it to him on the day of the rapture of the church. But it is necessary for him to remain in holiness. But we'll see further down. He is also speaking to the believers, to the faithful, those who believe in Christ. And I, and I say that the fact that a person has believed in Christ it means that it's given God a chance to regenerate him. But what matters is for him to continue to be faithful. To be always before God. To be standing always before God with absolute trust. And when we say faithful, we mean I trust the person, Jesus Christ, and his words. 
Can somebody be a faithful person and it's not being a saint? Yes, that's why the Apostle Paul says, I've kept the faith. And he starts, I fought the good fight of holiness. I have kept my, I finished my road being led by the Holy Spirit. And I have kept my faith. So these are things that we strive to do. Holiness, and we must walk in the path, and we must also preserve our faith. Always by the grace of Christ, always with the power of the Holy Spirit. But it is our responsibility to fight the good fight. Indeed, the Apostle Paul, regarding Timothy, he says... Wage the good warfare, which means you must always be at war. And you must make war with the good warfare. How? By having faith, you mustn't lose your faith, and a good conscience. I'll go a bit further down, but I will return again in the end. The, the wish that Paul gives is grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace, grace is this activity of God that settles the matters of sin. Because God, from his na man from his nature, even the born-again person, has weaknesses. He's weak. And he has an enemy across of him who is cunning. And of course he will not come in the appearance as he truly is. But he will come to create doubts in the Word of God. He will come to lead you into unbelief. He will come to tempt you, to provoke you. He will come to deceive you, to tell you his lies, so that he will make you slip away from the absolute truth of the Word of God. He will come to accuse some brother or God to you so that he may ruin your heart so that your heart is not pure he has his methods but all these things we overcome them by the grace of God through Jesus Christ you cannot overcome these things God, sin is put in order by the grace of God. And when do we find grace before Him so that the problems and our weaknesses and our sins to be settled, of our mistakes, when we are able to humble ourselves before God and men so that truly we may find grace by, by God and other men. But why? must we find grace by God and men. Because sin is all iniquity. Anything that is out of the will of God, that is a transgression to the Word of God, that is far from the will of God, and the will of God is revealed to us through the written Word, for starters, and with the voice of the Holy Spirit afterward. So whatever is this thing, that distances us from the will of God is sin. So we need to humble ourselves before God so that we may find grace in the eyes of God and that all iniquity and all transgression, all sin may be taken off of us by the blood of Jesus Christ. The person who cannot humble himself before God, that is, he cannot testify that he stumbles in many things and it is no one else's fault, not like Adam and Eve, who Adam said, Eve deceived me, and Eve said, the devil deceived me. They spoke the truth, but the problem isn't there. What, it doesn't matter who led you and who forced you and who took you astray so that you may commit sin. Humility is for you to say, no matter whose fault it is, I committed the sin, so it's my fault. So I humble myself and I call upon the blood of Christ. Then you will find grace. When the Christian excuses himself before God and justifies himself with any excuse,
Because every person, because he is reasonable and logical, he has excuses. And God doesn't like these excuses. What God likes is humility, repentance, and returning and confession of sins. Of course we will find grace by God always, but only when we take upon us all the responsibility of our works, of our deeds, and of our course. Without searching to find that any form of excuse or to cast responsibility on any person. So grace sets in order all our sins, our iniquities that are, we've committed before God. When we humble ourselves and testify and admit that it is only my fault. I'm the only one whose fault it is. Nobody else. Of course there are reasons for iniquity. But what matters is who does it. And the one who does it is guilty. And guilty is the man who is lawless, who is a transgressor. He humbles himself. He doesn't think about whose fault is it, why did I do it, how did I do it, and he told me, and, or the other person led me, and he offended me. No, none of all these things does he think about. And God comes by grace, and with the blood of Jesus Christ, clean, cleans away our sins. But we must also humble ourselves before men as well. Because all injustice is sin. Whatever you do that disturbs your brother, your neighbor, the one who's near you, or your enemy, whatever you do that gives a chance to the devil to mock the name of your Lord, that is a sin. And sin needs healing. And so that God may be able to act and forgive, first you must humble yourself and confess your sin to your brother, to your neighbor, to your enemy, so that there may be restoration of rela relationships, at least as much as it in our hand. Make peace with all men as much as is in your authority. If he doesn't want, then that is not your job. But injustice cannot leave from upon you unless you confess to the other man. And not only when the other person's at fault, but even when you're at fault and somebody else has something against you. Forgive me. Not only when it's your fault, but also when the other person is wrong and he has something against you, you will have to find a way to make friends with him. Because otherwise your prayer has no response. It does not become accepted by God. You'll find no grace by God. It is necessary for us to make peace with all men so that there may be holiness in our life because of which and without which we cannot see the face of the Lord. So it is necessary, the grace of God, but it comes from the understanding and the humility of man toward God for their iniquities and toward his fellow men, brothers, neighbors, and enemies even, if you have offended him, if you have wronged him, or if he has something against you. Why? Because if you do not humble yourself, you'll find no grace by God. And if you do not find grace by God, you cannot approach God and your prayers aren't heard. You see, my dear brethren, how sensitive it is for you to be a holy Christian. It's not a simple thing. It's not simple at all. And many times pe a person finds it difficult to humble himself, but blessed is the person to whom God has given a spirit of a humble person so that he easily can humble himself, can forgive, and ask forgiveness. Because 
as dangerous and evil it is for your sins to not have been forgiven, equally and even more dangerous is it for you to not have forgiven the sins of others. Indeed, in this case, the Word of God speaks about tormentors and about being bound. And bound. You are bound and the other person is bound. It's not a simple thing, the holiness of man, which, as we know very well, happens by the Word of God and by the Holy Spirit. But it is in the responsibility of man. And for that reason, our Lord Jesus Christ says, Be holy, imitate God, and walk in love. Be holy, for I am holy. If you are not holy, you cannot approach God. You pray in vain. It's in vain. Why is my prayer not heard? It will never be heard unless you first settle your relationship with the person that God has brought next to you, brother, neighbor, or even enemy, according to the Word of God. Unless you humble yourself so you can find grace by God, and unless you humble yourself so you can find grace by God in every iniquity and transgression of yours. So holy is the person who puts in order the issues of his sin, of his sins by the grace of God and the grace of Christ. Now who's faithful? Faithful is the same and if not more difficult for you to preserve your faith. For that reason, a necessary condition is for there to be the peace of God. The Apostle Paul wishes for this thing, and my dear brethren, the letters of the New Testament are not something to just talk about, to chat about. Every word has the power of the Holy Spirit. You cannot be faithful unless there is the peace of God in your life. Now, what is the peace of God? There are issues in our life that torment us. Individuals, situations, difficulties that torment our soul. Or even passions, ambition, cares of this world, cares of this life. These things, all these things, difficult situations that we face do one thing they bring turmoil to our heart and when man has turmoil in his heart he doesn't trust God he doesn't believe in God he cannot trust him because he prays and he doesn't see a response time goes by he hopes the first month the second month the first year the second year but he doesn't see a response. And so the peace of God leaves him. He has no peace. And when he has no peace, man has no faith. Because peace is a result of the righteousness of God, which righteousness of God is a result of the faith of man. He may have some point of holiness, but if he has no faith, he loses it all. Now, grace, we spoke about it. We spoke how you win it over. It's again in our own initiative. Faith and peace, sorry, is again our own initiative. The Apostle Paul describes to us with great detail the peace of God. Let us read from the letter to the Philippians. Don't be mindful for anything. Don't struggle. Let your heart not be troubled. Christ promises and says, I give my peace to you. So when you have turmoil and worry and fear, in agony, then your, your power leaves you. And your power leaves you because there's no faith in you. 
Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious doesn't mean don't worry about things, don't take care of things. Nor does it mean don't work or be lazy or be slothful. It doesn't say this. Anxious, anxiety is a matter of the soul and of the so, of the spirit and of logic. Anxiety is uh, my heart is afraid and my spirit is worrisome. The heart ruins the thought and the thought ruins the emotions. And there's this this cycle that goes on from bad to worse. And you can't find a way out. For that reason, the world outside is, is, is full of medication because they need some peace in their soul. They want some rest. They want some calm. They cannot sleep at night. They cannot quiet down. They're afraid. They're afraid of their wife, their husband, of their children. They're afraid of the boss. They're afraid of their job. They worry. They strive. They struggle. But there's no good result. And there can't be a good result in man. Only the Word of God leads man in finding his peace, his tranquility, his sense of direction, his faith, his trust in God. For that reason, the Apostle Paul says, Be anxious for nothing. Stop worrying. Stop being anxious and fearful and afraid. Stop already, the Apostle Paul cries out. Come and let me tell you what you must do. Because you cannot go on toward the rapture full of worry, agony, and, and turmoil, and no feeling, no, no uh, peace during the days, the hours of the day. Worry about nothing, therefore. Stop worrying. Stop thinking about these things for a while, being afraid. Stop it. And do what? But in everything that troubles you, take it to your place of prayer and make it known to God. Say it to God. Make your request known to God with thanksgiving because you have entered the good road, the right path the path that will bring the peace of God into your life. We thank you, Lord, because we have found the solution of our problems. We have found it. The solution won't come from us. You will bring the solution. I thank you because I know what I have to do now. With thanksgiving, he says, and then begin to pray and offer supplications, making your requests known to the Lord. And I suggest to you that this prayer, if you may permit me this expression, humanly speaking, that it may be formal. What does a formal prayer mean? All the problems that trouble me, I write them down on a piece of paper. I think about them, I describe them. The difficulties, the worries, the anxiety, everything. Not one. Because the one thing, even if it's set in order, another ten will jump out. But everything. I read it again. But in all things may your petitions be made known to God. The mistake that we make is what? I worry about my job today. Lord, help me at work. That's not it. Even if he helps you, is that over? No, it's not over. Whatever troubles you, write it down on a piece of paper. But everything, all the things of your heart, and for that reason I describe this type of prayer, humanly speaking, as the formal prayer. Prayer to the Lord. All the issues that bring me worry, agony, anxiety, and, and turmoil, by prayer and supplication, and then the intervention of God will come with certainty, because it is written here. And since it is written, it's impossible for it not to happen, because God is faithful to His Word. 
he cannot deny himself. And what will happen, therefore? Will they be solved magically, all your problems? No problems will be solved. But the peace of God that surpasses all understanding, <coughs> every human logic, the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your heart, your hearts and minds. That is, he will take away the worry, the fear, the anxiety, the, the care of this world. And he will come and clean out your heart and he will clean out your logic. That is, he will give you faith. Because when you have faith and trust in God, you can't fear anything. The peace of God, therefore, is what will give you faith. And when your heart and your logic, your hypostasis, is flooded with trust toward God, then from there on, you have taken the good course. Until that moment, we have, we're walking in the wrong path. What is the wrong path? The path of anxiety, of fear, of anger, of wrath, of bitterness. That leads where? To hell. But when? You make known all, and I repeat this, everything, all things, all petitions to God with thanksgiving and prayer, then God will perform a great miracle. He will give you faith of God. He will give you faith. You will trust God then. And by faith, He will guard the fears of your heart and the logic of man and the peace of God through Jesus Christ. He will drive away everything that makes you lose your faith. And what will happen then? You'll become a man of faith. But it doesn't end here. What will follow? Be careful. Be careful. You have to preserve this. You have to keep the peace of God. From there on, my brethren, whatever things are true, noble, just, whatever things are pure, if there are things that are lovely, whatever things are good, if there is any virtue and praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Until that point, what were you thinking? Bad things. What will happen if this occurs? And what will happen if the other things occur? And what will I do with my wife? And what will happen with my husband? And what will happen with my job? Oh, my, 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 my. And there's all these worries. Now, you will meditate on good things only. So what will you do? You will tame. And indeed, the scripture doesn't say, I tame my body and bring it. I put to death my body and I bring it in subjection. Because otherwise, I fight in the air. My prayer is vain. He says, I don't want to fight in the air. I don't want to run in vain and never reach the destination. Then, when you think, first of all, of all the good things, and also the things that you have learned and received from the Word of God, strive to do these things. That is, to become faithful, not a forgetful listener, but a true doer of works, then the God of peace will be with you always. And that's it. There goes your turmoil. There goes your anxiety. There goes your fears. Why? Because the almighty God of peace will, bring, will fill your heart with peace. And then the God of peace will sanctify your body, your soul, and spirit. Holy. Faithful and holy. What follows is wondrous. And I want us to read this thing, my dear brethren. Let me find it. So we can see the beautiful way in which God acts in the people that the God of peace is with them. Let us go so you can see how nicely the Apostle Paul, the Word of God, describes the good future. 
He sanctifies man in soul, body, and spirit. Hebrews 13.20 And the God of peace, who is this God of peace? The one who raised up. Now the God of peace who brought up Jesus, the Lord Jesus from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. You hear this? This is the God of peace. He is the God of peace who raised Christ. He raised him out of the dead and he made him sit on the right hand of the Father. The Almighty God. <clears throat> and how did he do this? By the Holy Spirit. This God of peace will make you complete. He will equip you. He will train you. He will learn you. In every good work, so you may do his will. He will train you so that you may do the will of God in every good work. <clears throat> As he will work in you what is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. In other words, the God of peace, the Almighty God who raised Christ from the dead and he made him sit at the right hand of the Father, the Almighty God will work in you this thing that is pleasing. He will do, he will work the will and to do of God in you. He will reveal what is pleasing before his eyes to you and he will give you the strength in equipping you to do the will of God that is good, perfect and pleasing. And what will you be then? You will be a doer of works. And then the God of peace Bible says the God of peace will swiftly crush Satan beneath your feet. In other words, then will God give a solution to your problems. But for your problems to be solved, I repeat, they are not solved as through magic, but they are solved your problems are solved by the grace of Christ and indeed by the God of peace. If there continues to be agony in your life and anxiety, there's no chance for you to see the hand of God mighty in your life. For that reason, the Apostle Paul says, I'm speaking to the holy and to the faithful, and I wish to you that the God and our Lord Jesus Christ to give you His grace and His peace. And I also repeat, the grace and the peace is in our their jurisdiction. He will give it to us, but it is in our jurisdiction. Grace, humility before God and man, peace, so that we drive away all worries by walking in the footsteps of our Lord Jesus Christ. Exactly. I repeat, it is not a simple thing for you to be holy. It is not a simple thing for you to be faithful. But all things are possible with God and all things are possible with him who believes in the word of God. A believer is somebody else, and the one who believes is something else. A believer is faithful in all things, but he who believes says, I found what I have to do and I'll do it. I believe now. He believes now that I will enjoy the peace of God, that God will be with me, the God of peace, and they will be solved. All things will be set in order, my difficulties, not in the way that I want but in the way that God will decide. This is the important thing, my dear brethren, that things be done not the way that we want, but the way that God has scheduled. Because we want, according to the things that we understand, and our knowledge is insignificant, our mind is so small. 
but having the grace and the peace of God, we trust the love of God, and it is a sure thing that God will act with a lot more greater and better way than the one that we can think of or we can ask for. And we thank God for His Word, my dear brethren. You know something, my brethren? The most beautiful gift that God has given to man is His Word. There's no more beautiful thing than that. Of course, it's the Holy Spirit as well, but the Holy Spirit is a result of the Word. All the gifts and the activities of God are performed by the Word. And for that reason, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word of God is that which equips man and makes and leads him into the paths of the righteousness of God. And we thank God for His Word. First of all, and above all, He has given us nothing more important to His children other than His Word. For that reason, let us love the Word of God. But we must love Him not in a theory, but through His Word. Let us love to walk according to His Word. Amen.